Welcome back. So what I want to do in these slides is talk through some of the most famous objections to Descartes' argument in the meditations. Remember that Descartes laid out uh, really a pretty elaborate argument from meditation one all the way to meditation six, um, starting with doubt of the things that he had believed since his childhood, things that he had learned, uh, any, of the, any of the beliefs that he had at present. He says he's going to call all of them into doubt. He calls them into doubt. It turns out that there's very little he can be certain of, he, it, he believes or he sees by the end of meditation one. And then in meditation two, he uh, believes he finds that he can be certain of his own existence as a thinking thing, the cogito. And from there, he uh, examines his ideas and comes to believe that he can know for certain that a good God exists. And then that justifies his uh, the, the reliability of any judgments he makes on the basis of clear and distinct ideas, which also justifies some of his beliefs about the external world and some of the information he gets from his senses, but not all of it, okay? Uh, most, mostly and basically the things that um, he's examined carefully and that can be justified from the standpoint of, say, mathematical physics. So a fairly uh, um, elaborate argument from meditation one to meditation six. But there are a number of, of objections that have famously been made to this argument at different points all the way through. So what I want to do in these uh, lectures is just point to some of those objections. Won't be able to go into great detail about, um, about them, but just want to at least show you where are the strings that you could pull to unravel parts of Descartes to argument potentially. The first of these is an objection to the method of doubt itself. So Descartes, remember, begins by saying he wants to see if there's anything at all he can be absolutely certain of. Um, if there's anything at all that can be a solid foundation for his beliefs. There are a few objections that one can make to this. Um, one is one can say, look, maybe we shouldn't even expect there to be a solid foundation for any of our beliefs. Maybe if we even look for that, we're just going down the wrong path philosophically. It's so unlikely that we're gonna be able to get something like that. Maybe we ought to practice philosophy in a way where we're not so anxious about having a solid foundation. Maybe we can just examine different beliefs one at a time and kind of think about what are the reasons for and against having them and drop the ones that they're on balance don't seem to be good reasons to hold and keep the ones that they're on balance seem to be good reasons to hold. Why suppose that knowledge has to be something like a house where there's a foundation at all. Why can't, maybe maybe knowledge is something more like a web where we have lots of different beliefs that support each other in different ways and we might take out a piece of the web, um, but other parts of the web would still be there. We might kind of reconstruct or reorganize, but there doesn't, there isn't any one set of beliefs or one belief or one source of belief that's a foundation for all of the rest. So that's one kind of objection that one can make here. Another objection that one can make here is that Descartes wants to see if there's anything he can be absolutely certain of. And his standard for what he can be absolutely certain of is what he can or can't doubt. Now, if you think about it, those two things are not obviously exactly the same. Finding a belief that um, you can't possibly doubt isn't necessarily the same as finding a belief that you can't be wrong about, right? There might be some belief that because of the way we're constituted, we can't doubt it. We're just unable to imagine it being otherwise. But nonetheless, we're still wrong about it, okay? It's still incorrect. It's at least conceivable that our minds are that way. So the fact that Descartes associates something being undoubtable with something being absolutely certain is questionable. Or another way to put it is that he, that he associates being undoubtable with definitely being correct or definitely being right or true is questionable. Another set of objections that can be made are to the dreaming argument in meditation one. So I asked you all um, to do some reflecting on whether or not you think you can tell the difference between uh, when you're dreaming and when you're awake. 
And some uh, people reading that argument have argued that you can tell, there are ways to tell. Um, I don't think I'll say more about it. I mean, some of it has to do with how our ideas are related to each other when we are dreaming and when we're awake. Uh, when we're awake, it seems like when we're awake and when we're, let's say, in our right minds, when we're you know, thinking the way that we usually do, or, or in a way that's sort of uh, normal, uh, like healthy human thinking, let's say, um, then our ideas are connected with one another in a number of really uh, rich ways. And we can like deliberately think back to specific times in the past and how those events are related to other events. There's a very um, elaborate set of connections between our ideas when we're awake. When we're asleep, it's it's much harder to reconstruct that elaborate um, that that elaborate a connection between our ideas. So that could be a criterion between being asleep and awake. Um, I don't want to claim to have done a really good job of presenting this objection. I just want to give you a, a, some indication of how uh, a, one strategy that people have had of objecting to the dreaming argument. Another objection can be made to the evil genius argument. So you remember that at the end of Meditation 1, Descartes imagines a kind of, um, and, and this is kind of his master argument, like this is the argument that really, really convinces him that he can't know anything for certain. Basically what he says is, can I know for certain that there isn't an all powerful evil God that is deceiving me about everything that it possibly can deceive me about, okay? And if I can't disprove that, then how can I know anything else for certain? Of course, in meditation too, he ends up saying he can know his own existence for certain, so he gets out of that condition. But at the end of meditation one, he thinks that this is a very, very, very strong argument against knowing any, at least any of the things he's considered so far, like the knowledge on the basis of his senses or of his own reasoning. Since he can't rule out the evil genius case, um, he can't know any, it seems like he can't know anything else for certain at the end of meditation one. Now, an objection to this that has been made is that when we imagine the evil genius, we must imagine, uh, and we imagine his, his, this evil genius's manipulation of our thinking. We must be imagining um, something somewhat uh, specific. I mean, we must have definite ideas about like what an idea is and what's inside our mind and what's outside our mind. If we're being deceived about everything that we think, then we shouldn't even be able to coherently think of those things. We shouldn't even be able to coherently think of the evil genius in the first place. So it, it's almost like if the evil genius is, is, if the evil genius, the evil God is deceiving us about everything that we possibly can be deceived about, then we shouldn't even be able to come up with the idea of the evil genius, okay? The only way that we could come up with an idea of the evil genius is if we're not wrong about something in addition to just our kokito, that we're not wrong about, say, the connection between intelligences and things that they can manipulate, okay? These kinds of general things about the scenario, about what it is to manipulate an idea or deceive somebody, the meanings of terms like deceive, those have to be uh, reliable, those have to be something that apply to the system that we're imagining we're describing. Um, and if they, if, if that's the case, then it's not true that we're wrong about everything. On the other hand, if um, it is the case that 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 we're being deceived and so on, or, or what we're imagining is, uh, is true, then again, we're not deceived about everything. So there's really no way, either we're not deceived about everything or we're not deceived about everything. There's no way of actually coherently imagining the scenario because just by imagining the scenario, we're already, we're already describing ourselves as not in that scenario. Another objection to the evil genius argument that can be made, this, is, this objection was made by Hillary 
Putnam in the 1980s. And it, it's similar to the objection that I just expressed, but uh, maybe a little bit different. So Putnam imagined, P Putnam asked essentially the same question as Descartes did. He asked, um, how do I know that I'm not a brain in a vat? That is, that my uh, that, that this whole world isn't an illusion and that it's that it, that 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 that, my, that the real world is one where my brain is in a vat in a case somewhere and it's just being pumped with information about uh, or it's being pumped with an, with sort of illusory information about the world that I perceive so that the world that I perceive is all a simulation and the real world has my brain in a vat somewhere so Putnam's argument was that when we try to describe the brain in a vat world our words can't possibly be referring to anything. They can't possibly actually be about anything because we've never experienced the brain in that world and everything that we refer to has to somehow be related to things that we experience or that other people have experienced that we're talking with them about. So there's no way to, to get to a description of the brain in that world that's meaningful. Anything we say about the imaginary brain in a vat world, the, the one that we're saying, like, maybe it actually exists, anything we say about it is uh, basically uh, meaningless. I mean, it, it, it's, not, um, it's not related to the reality that we participate in uh, in a way that makes our words have a definite meaning. Um, the only way to understand our words is we're sort of saying, look, uh, we could like look at brains in a vat in this world, or we can imagine a brain in a vat of the type that we experience in this world, and we can imagine some other world that's like that. But as soon as we start um, asking, like, could that be real? We're just, um, we're, we're, our words no longer successfully are about anything because we're, again, talking about something that uh, our words can't possibly have a real connection to. So that might not be convincing to you, but um, I just wanted to mention it as a um, as something to think about as a potential objection. The way it would apply to the evil genius argument is you'd say as soon as when, when you imagine an evil genius deceiving you about everything that you are thinking, your words stop making sense because in order for the words to make sense, the genius has to not be deceiving you. Um, so your words make sense only under the condition that the genius doesn't deceive you, including your words about the evil genius. Um, and there I think you see why the brain in a vat, uh, um, Putnam's response to the brain in a vat question is similar to the objection to the evil genius argument that I gave just a moment ago.